Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's episode is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Thanks so much for your support. You can support the show at uh, support.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time to get into today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. It's time for the Broderick Matter, Part 3 and Part 4. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bob Steele, Eastern Trust. How's New York? Fine, but I haven't found Lorraine Broderick yet. How about your lead? What was his name? Dameron? He hasn't seen her since Christmas Eve a couple of years ago. She walked out on him with 6,500 bucks. Uh, What now? You, uh, want to keep on with it, Mr. Steele? Sure, we have to pay her off, even if it is only $1,500. You sound like this was all the farther you want to go. Uh, It might be at that. Oh, what did you say? Look, a sweet old man left a nice little girl $1,500. Apparently, I'm looking for a grown woman who isn't very nice anymore. Beside the point, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, Steele, I'm still on the case. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City, New York. To the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. Subject, Lorraine Broderick. Object, to locate her and pay off claim. Results, disillusioning. More expenses. Item 9, 3 bucks, cab fare. From the plush offices of William Dameron to a filling station out on Long Island to check his story of Lorraine's disappearance. A major oil company owned and operated the filling station where Lorraine Broderick had last been seen. Their payroll records named three attendants on duty, Christmas Eve, that is, in 1953. Item 10, $28, more cab fare, and don't squawk about it. I located and interviewed all three. Enclosed fine statement of Edward Quinlan. Sure, I remember that chick. Better looking in this picture, I'll tell you that. She drove in with this old guy, uh, Dameron, you said, yeah. Well, he hadn't been away from the car 20 seconds before she was out walking down the street as fast as she could, long dress and all. When he come back and asked what had happened to her, I told him. So he went and sat in his car for maybe a couple hours waiting for her to come back. I knew she was gone for good. He knew it too, must have. But he waited. I felt sorry for him. Poor old geezer, even if he did drive a kid. She shouldn't have run out on him like that, Christmas Eve and all. Pauline Dameron Whitfield, sister of William Dameron, living up in Westchester County, verified her brother's story. Lorraine Broderick had left all of her clothes and bags at her house. Mrs. Whitfield had not heard from her or seen her since Christmas Eve, 1953. A check of the luggage revealed no information that would be helpful in locating Lorraine Broderick. The following morning at the New York Police Department downtown, I requested a missing persons investigation on Lorraine Broderick. She was booked in under an alias, Jane Brown. When I got to court, she gave her right name, Lorraine Broderick. What was the charge, Sergeant? Misdemeanor, drunk, disturbing a piece. Twenty-five bucks in night court, April 25th, 1953. Is that the only time she made the blotter? Yep. What's the address, Sergeant? 1346 Yardley. 1346 Yardley, years ago. thanks. <laughs> At the address on Yardley, I learned that Lorraine Broderick had moved 18 months before. Again, there was no forwarding address, but the landlady turned out to be quite talkative. 
I'm glad she moved away from here, Mr. Dollar. I'd like to help you find her, but I'm awful glad she moved away. Why do you say that, Mrs. Gaines? Noisy. Parties all the time. I run a quiet place, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you do. When she first come here to rent the apartment, I thought she was the quiet type. Nice. She looked like she was just out of finishing school or something like that. Oh, she couldn't have been more than 20 years old. Well, maybe a little more, 22. She told me she was a secretary and she worked in Manhattan. Well, I let her have the apartment, of course. She paid her rent in advance, in cash. But once she was in, it was a different story. Yeah, yeah. Did, uh, did she tell you where she worked in Manhattan? No, no, she never quite got around to mentioning that. Anyway, she couldn't have worked very hard. All the dates she had, night after night, honestly. Do you happen to know any of them, Mrs. Gaines? I do not. Big, noisy parties. Well, uh, did she go with any particular man? A smart little girl like that sticking to just one man? I don't know whether she was very smart at all. Was she friendly with anybody in the building? Nope. Any idea where she might have gone from here? Nope. All I can say is I'm glad she don't live here no more. I went back to police headquarters. It had occurred to me that hardly anyone is ever arrested for being drunk and disturbing the peace alone. I was right. The night court files revealed that Lorraine Broderick had been arrested with five other people. Three men and two women. I took down their names and began to check them out. Number three down the line was a man named Tyler in the hosiery business. Yes, he remembered Lorraine Broderick very well. No, he hadn't seen her for six months, but he could tell me where she lived. He'd seen her going in and out of an apartment on 61st Street several times. He gave me the address. The boy will take your bag, will he? Yes, sir, may I help you? I'm looking for a Miss Lorraine Broderick. Broderick? Yes. I'm sorry, sir, we have no one by that name registered here. That's funny. I thought at first you were going to say Lorraine Bradley. We had a Mrs. Bradley here at one time. Oh. Did Mrs. Bradley look anything like this picture? Yes, that's Mrs. Bradley. Bradley, huh? How long ago did she move out? Uh, four months ago, anyhow. You have her forwarding address? No, sir, I don't. I wish I did. Huh? Mrs. Bradley wrote us a bad check for her rent. We've been trying to locate her. Did you report it to the police? Yes, sir. I understand she's been quite active along those lines. They're looking for her, too. For the third time in one day, I was back at police headquarters, this time inquiring about a Lorraine Bradley. There were five wants on her for passing bad checks. Gave it up about four months ago here in New York, looks like. Then we got a buzzer from Chicago. She was there for a couple of weeks. Wrote about $600 in wallpaper. San Francisco people are looking for her, too. Oh, here's something came in yesterday. Last job in Santa Barbara, three days ago. Expense account item 11, $4.05. One long-distance phone call to Mr. Steele at Eastern Trust in Hartford. Using the name Bradley, huh? Yeah, it's probably just a phony. No record of a marriage in New York City to anyone that name. I looked. What's wrong with her, anyhow? I don't know. Well, you better get out to the coast and find out. Item 12, $38, hotel, board, and miscellaneous while in New York City. Item 13, $258.60, New York to Santa Barbara. A little town by the Pacific that impressed me is not caring one thing about the rest of the world. Sun, sea, a pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of smug, expensive homes. At the police station, a Sergeant Martin was out, so I went over to the Harbor Inn to meet the latest victim of Lorraine Broderick's talents, a hotel operator named Harrington. Tall, gray-haired, slack, sport shirt, suntan, and sandals. I, uh, I suppose I'm avoiding this business and your questions because I still feel quite chagrined about this whole thing. Pretty understandable, Mr. Harrington. On the face of it, you, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 30 seconds instead of 30 years way she took me. Well, if it's any comfort, she's done the same thing in several cities and as many hotels. No comfort, thank you. She was that good, huh? Brother, she was the best. She pranced in here as big as life, probably didn't have a nickel in the purse. What's more, for the whole four days she was here, she didn't break stride once. Only the best of everything. Uh-huh. Let's see, she, uh, she gave you a check for $813, is that right? Painfully right. I took it. No questions. <laughs> Every night in the dining room, she'd order champagne, special dishes. 
I'll give you some idea of how she carried on. Yeah, I get the idea. I've seen my share of grifters and bad check artists, but she tops them all. Fume, clothes, luggage, conversation. Can I ask you a question? Humiliated already, go ahead. She checked in here alone, registered as Mrs. Lorraine Bradley, Beverly Hills, right? That's right. Well, now, didn't it strike you as odd that a woman would check in a place like this, a resort hotel, alone, stay four days and uh, meet no one, see no one? You're wrong. She didn't keep to herself. Became friends with at least half a dozen guests in the place. And the way she was throwing my money around, why not? She picked up all the tabs. She threw me off right from the start. Let's talk about that. Start at the top, please. Well, she showed up last Wednesday night in a cab loaded down with luggage. Probably wrote a bad check for that someplace. Probably. She uh, came swinging into the lobby with a cabbie following her. Told the night clerk she wanted to see me. When I came down the stairs, she yelled, Harry, ran up, kissed me, asked me how my wife was. <laughs> you beat that. No. Nope. All those tricks that your mind plays on you, I suppose, I, uh, I actually thought I did remember her from somewhere. Pretty good. What was her story? Uh, she said she was on her way back from Lake Tahoe, wanted to rest up. Something about just getting a divorce, being awarded 3000 a month alimony. That impressed me. It would impress anyone, Mr. Harrington. Did she make up any kind of a story about where she'd met you before? No, no, no story. But I got the impression, and or she saw to it, that she had stopped here before. I wasn't altogether a boob. I, I did check her home address in Beverly Hills. There was a Robert Bradley listed there, same address she gave Later on, I found out that he's in Europe with his wife and children. But his name was in the book. Oh, yes. So getting back to that part about her being familiar. That's just a good trick on her part, Ella. I did think I'd known her from somewhere, and, well, she also arranged it so that I was too embarrassed to ask her specifically. In all honesty, I, I suppose I wanted to have known her. Can you explain that? It was about the most beautiful thing I ever saw. She walked through that door right now and told me none of this was true. I'd probably believe her. Mm -hmm. Do you have a copy of her hotel account? I'd like to look it over. Why? Well, the phone calls, mostly. Maybe she contacted someone we can trace. Mm -mm. No, no phone calls. Here. This check was drawn on a bank in Beverly Hills. Was it personalized? No. Maybe I should have thought something of that. Huh? Not particularly. Well, here's this much. I can't... Can't stand to look it over. It makes me kind of sick. $813. I spent another hour with Mr. Harrington as he distastefully covered the items on the bill she'd paid for with that bad check. Later that afternoon, I met with Sergeant Martin, Santa Barbara Police, who reported that a woman answering Lorraine's description had passed bad checks in Burlingame, Santa Maria, and Ojai, California. Expense account item 14, $102.85. Transportation to Monterey and Santa Cruz, where I interviewed two other hotel managers who had filed complaints. Their stories were pretty much the same as Harrington's, down to the pretended familiarity, the divorce, and alimony details. Item 15, $4.15. Long-distance phone call, Steele again in Hartford. That you, Johnny? Yeah, Mr. Steele. I've been hopping around all over the state. Policeman in Santa Barbara called here trying to find you, Sergeant Martin. He says he's got a line on her. Huh? He's done it again. Out down to Malibu Beach. The man who runs the seaside inn there found out her check was bad 15 minutes after she left. Now get started. You shouldn't be more than an hour behind her. Mr. Steele, I'm on my way. Johnny Dollar. Dollar, my name's King, Malibu Sheriff Station. Did you leave a message here? Oh, yes, sir. I understand you're looking for Lorraine Broderick. Broderick or Bradley, whatever name she's using. We want her. I'm looking for her, too. Well, what's your connection? I'm an insurance investigator. We've been trying to find her all the way from Hartford. We have to pay off a claim that's due her. Claim? Yeah, that's right. An old man left her $1,500. Huh. She doesn't deserve it, not that one. I can't tell him that. He's dead. I'm expecting a little action on it pretty quick. Like to be in on it. Come on over. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Malibu Beach, California. 
to the Eastern Trust Insurance Company Claims Division, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Broderick matter. More expenses, item 15, $38 even, more transportation. My trip here to Malibu Beach, where I didn't even bother listening to another disgruntled hotel proprietor repeat a bad check story I knew only too well. I went directly to the sheriff's station and Deputy King. Well, that's about the picture, Mr. Dollar. Lorraine Bradley was at the end of four days and checked out this morning. Use the name Bradley. Lorraine Bradley. She can't be too far ahead of you now. I hope not. This has been a long, rough chase. While she was at the inn, she took up with one of our local residents, a man named Joe Tappan, who lives over in the beach colony. We know this much. He drove her into town this morning when she checked out of the inn. Have you talked to this man Tappan yet? He hasn't come back yet. When did she leave the inn? Oh, about ten this morning. Uh Uh-huh. After two now. Uh, It gives him just about time. Here's a house over in the colony. We've got a man there. Colony? Uh, Down the road a piece. They call it that because a lot of movie stars built beach homes there 25 or 30 years ago. Movie colony, right in the beach. Oh, this Tappan, is he an actor? Yeah, when he gets work, which isn't very often. Mainly, he keeps suntan. Excuse me. Sure. Yeah, this king. Oh. Good, right away. Tappan just drove up to his house. Let's go. I went with Deputy King to talk with Joe Tappan. He turned out to be a healthy, muscular man in his mid-thirties. By the time we got there, he was in trunks and sunglasses, sitting on a porch at the front of his house. He was a little stunned by the news we brought him. What? The rain of phony. Are you sure about this, Sheriff? That's the man at the seaside inn. Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. Is this Lorraine? Go ahead, look at him. Well, that... Looks like Lorraine. Yes, but I can't be sure. She's older. Well, I mean, the girl in this picture's pretty young. It's her, all right. Mr. Dollar's been looking all over the country for her. Hartford, New York City, up and down this coast. Well, come on. Let's go up to the house. I thought I knew her pretty well. How long did you know her, Mr. Tappan? Well, not long, but I knew her. I really did. When did you meet her? The first night she checked into the seaside inn. Four days, then. Yeah. Uh, Want something to drink? No. No, thanks. Well, I think I'll have... No, no, no. I I don't want to talk about her. We have to talk about her, Mr. Tappan. But I'm sure there's some explanation about the check. She'd have to explain quite a few checks. Right, Dollar? Yeah, that's about it. Mr. Tappan, I understand you drove her into Los Angeles this morning. Uh, That's right. I took her to the Beverly Glen Hotel. Did she check in there? No, she just dumped her luggage. She told me she didn't know whether or not she'd have to go to Chicago tonight. Something about a house she owned there that had to be rented or sold. Uh Uh-huh. Did you leave her there at the Beverly Glen? Uh, No. She made a phone call and said she had to meet her lawyer. Did she say where? A bar in Hollywood. Uh, The Topper, I think it was, on Coinga Boulevard. I drove her over there and left her. When was this? A couple of hours ago, I guess. About noon. How was she dressed? Black, strapless... Wore a fur stole. Did she mention any names, tell you anything about herself? Oh, yes. She told me that six months ago, a little boy was killed in an automobile accident. He was only two years old. She said that was the thing that broke up her marriage to this Bradley. Uh Uh-huh. And she told me that she needed to believe in something again. Uh, Someone. And that she needed someone to believe in her. Well, there wasn't any little boy or any husband, Mr. Tappan. There have been a couple of men I've talked to, a dentist in Hartford, a businessman in New York, who felt the same way as you do about her. Well, even with what you told me, I believe what she said. Why, why she cried a little when she was telling me. Oh, I I don't care how you look at me. I, I don't think that anyone could invent a story that tragic without some sort of basis. A good liar can see a story in a newspaper like that one and adapt it for his own needs. But I am an actor, sir, and I can tell when other people are acting. She wasn't. She... She... Well, go on, Mr. Tappan. Look, I've got a suggestion for you. Uh, What's your name? Dollar. I've got a suggestion for you. Try believing what people tell you sometime. It'll do something with that habit you have of bearing down with your eyes. Okay, the next time I have two weeks off. What? See you, Mr. Tappan. I drove into Hollywood with Deputy King. 
At the Beverly Glen Hotel, a worried clerk was still wondering what to do with the 14 pieces of luggage Lorraine Broderick had deposited there earlier. No, she was not registered at the hotel. No, she hadn't phoned in and given him any instructions. Deputy King made arrangements for a man to cover the lobby in case she showed up to claim her things, and we went into the topper. What'll it be, gentlemen? Police. I'd like to talk to the man who was on duty here at noon today. Oh, that's me, sir. Is there anything wrong? Now, this is Mr. Dollar. We're trying to locate a woman who's been using the name Lorraine Bradley. We were told she was in here around noon today. No, I don't recognize that name, sir. About 5'5", five, five, dark brown hair, brown eyes, 24 years old, wore a black strapless summer dress and a stole. Yeah, it's uh, 24... No, no, nobody like that in all day. No, sir, noon is a pretty slow time, sir. I'd have noticed if anybody like that came in, I think. Have you been on duty all that time? I came on at 10. That's when we opened. Are you sure this is the right place, the topper? Now, this is the place. Well, I wish I could help you, sir, but I'm sorry. Excuse me, will you? Well, we struck out. One thing. What's that? That luggage at the Beverly Glen. Yeah. We'll keep an eye on it. Lorraine Broderick did not return to the Beverly Glen Hotel that day to claim her luggage. The lobby was watched around the clock. Her description was on the Daily Bullet, and every policeman in Los Angeles was on the lookout for her. I spent my time thinking about the little girl who had helped an old man sell newspapers one afternoon years ago. A little girl with a face like an angel. I didn't feel good about this case. But Joe Tappan felt worse when I went to see him again. Well. Hi. Mind if I come in? What now, Mr. Dollar? Your girlfriend. What about her? I've been thinking about what you told us. So? So maybe you didn't understand what I told you. <laughs> now, look I'm here. not pushing my weight around, Tappan. But it seems to me you're a little stubborn in what you want to believe about her. How old did she tell you her baby was that she lost in a car accident? Two years old. All right. Two years ago, she was working for a dentist in Hartford, Connecticut. He was pretty much in love with her. She left him flat to take up with a man in the brokerage business in New York. She left him flat took $6,500 when she did it. There wasn't any baby in her life then. Her name was Lorraine Broderick. It still is. Now, would you like to see my file on her? I brought it along. No, thanks. I thought I'd better prove that part was a lie. So you proved it. Mind if I sit down? Help yourself. Thanks. Do you have anything else to tell me? I suppose I do, Mr. Tappan, since you don't seem to want to tell me anything. Now, just sit down, please. I've heard every man who knew her describe her, and I think I can understand why they feel the way they do. All I've got is a picture from a high school annual taken when she was 17. That was pretty good. She's 24 now. She must be seven years better. Anyhow, you're my only hope now. What? Lorraine Broderick can get away from the police for a while. Oh, yeah, she's smart and clever, and she can go right on doing these same things she's been doing all along, stealing, writing bad checks. But that's police business. My part is to find her and give her something one man left her, an insurance bequest. But it's become more than that now, to find her and stop her, maybe. Look, they'll get her eventually, Tappan. Do you know what five years in prison can do to a woman like her? Do you? Well, because I know her and she passed a few bad checks doesn't mean that I'm responsible in any way. You're right, it doesn't. But you're involved just the same. Oh, you're different from just some hotel man who's been tilted. You're a boyfriend... True, just a four-day boyfriend. But a woman like Lorraine Broderick can do a lot of damage in four days' time. Why are you here? What do you want? I'm here to disillusion you, Tappan, because I don't think you're disillusioned enough. Now, just You're a one... perfect stranger to me. I don't know you from a Grand Rapids chair, but I'm doing you a favor talking to you about Lorraine Broderick. I'm doing you a favor telling you she's a crook and a thief and a forger, and everything she ever told you was a lie. Now and then, a woman walks into a man's life that he'd sell his soul for. But all she'll do in return is write you a bad check for it. She's trouble in a great big way, Tappan. You know it as well as I do. Well, what do you want me to do? Apologize for meeting her? I'll be satisfied if you tell me where she is. What? And stop lying. Now, now, now look here. I've listened to all I Lorraine want to... Broderick to... never went to that bar in Hollywood you were talking about yesterday. You didn't drop her off there. No one there has ever seen her. And she's the kind who could walk around the polo grounds with 50,000 other people and still be seen. Now, where did you take her? Where is she now? Uh, 
Could it, um, could it be fixed so she wouldn't know I told you? I suppose so. She's at the Wentmore downtown, registered under the name of Evelyn Brady. Oh, this, this beats me, Dollar. I just don't understand it. What do you mean? How what you told me is true, I know that. But an hour ago, she called me up here and she said, Joe, I love you. Now, that sounded true, too. And I told her that I loved her. Now I'm turning her in. <laughs> what kind of crazy world do we live in? Expense account item 16, $14. Cab fare from Malibu to downtown Los Angeles in the Wentmore Hotel. A second-rate old-timer on Figueroa Street. A little different from the swank spots where Lorraine Broderick had lived so gaily. The clerk told me she was in 1302. I walked down the hall to Lorraine Broderick's room. The door was standing partially open. All of the lights seemed to be on. Hello? Hello? Hello, anybody? Go back! Huh? Get out of this room! What? Get away! You're out of I'd found Lorraine Broderick at last. Only she was standing on a ledge outside the window. All ready for a leap into eternity. There'll be another intriguing episode of the Broderick matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the end of the trail. For me... And for Lorraine Broderick. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, uh, this has just been a masterful uh, performance by Bob Bailey here. Um, this has really kind of required this um, shift uh, in characterization. And I, I rem this is uh, one of the better uh, of these serials, and you'll see it again on Friday. Yet another uh, shift by Bailey. We start off very vis wistful and optimistic, and then we get the slow process of disillusionment that comes out in this episode. He almost got a sense while he was talking to the boyfriend that it, it was as if it was almost a misery loves company, a little bit of it, though I think he was also legitimately concerned for what this guy was going to do for his life for someone who um, really had proven herself... Uh, uh, dishonorable. And then we, we ramp up, I think, with just a fascinating cliffhanger for, uh, uh, Friday. All right. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback. 
And uh, we have this email from John. Just wanted to say that you have a great show and I enjoy listening to it. I have a suggestion regarding the Johnny Dollar Show. I think it would be better to have a 30-minute show and a 45-minute show rather than the current setup. No matter how you segment it, I will be listening. Well, thanks a lot, John. Um, I appreciate the feedback. And and I know this will kind of be, uh, it's been kind of a conversation uh, we've had with a few listeners. Um, I'll tell you kind of what kind of led me in this uh, particular direction was actually listening to all the Johnny Dollar serials. I did this over a course of a year, and I never actually listened to more than um, one serial a day. And usually on the part five uh, parts, there really was this kind of sense of uh, suspense. And so I do like... Um, I do like uh, the way that it sets up here uh, for the final part, and a lot. And it, you know, I think as we've gone through this, a lot of listeners have pointed out it's, pretty, you know, that there are ways to, you know, just kind of say, okay, but I'd rather do it this way, and um, able to um, uh, basically save up the episodes, and that way you kind of. Uh, and customize it that way by, you know, saving episodes from one week listening to them the next week. But I really want to um, let people kind of have that feeling of excitement, suspense, waiting for part five, for the payoff for the adventure we've kind of been following all week. And I'm not certain there's a good way to do that, uh, splitting them up three and two. I suppose we could do four and one, but that would kind of make things uh, uneven. So I appreciate the feedback. I think we're going to stick with this way, though. So uh, thanks so much uh, for your comments, and that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Sherlock Holmes, and Friday, that uh, payoff for this uh, tense, emotional serial, The Broderick Matter. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter, Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.